Hi guys, welcome back. This is Professor Hank, and in this video, I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of some object-oriented programming concepts in C++. Going to take a brief look at inheritance, polymorphism, virtual functions, abstract base classes, right? So we're going to get a little bit of a feel for how those things work. And we'll start off a little bit with inheritance. What is inheritance anyway? It's the ability to take an existing class and build a new class off of it, right? So that way you don't have to, you know, repeat yourself. Okay, what's polymorphism? Polymorphism is the ability to treat different items as if they were the same, right? So in this context, we'll be able to treat different objects as if they were the same object. Okay, so you might have a foo and a bar, and you want to treat them all as if they were, both of them as if they were spams right so even though they're two different things you can treat them like they are the same thing uh, we'll talk about virtual functions and the role that that plays in polymorphism and inheritance and then we'll talk about an abstract base class and an abstract base class is a type of class that exists purely to be inherited from right it's kind of like a starting point a template if you will Okay, and that's going to require us creating a virtual function or, or specifically, or more accurately, a pure virtual function to make that happen. As usual, we'll have a programming example and then we'll finish up with a little bit of uh, UML, right? So let's get started. All right, so I got ourselves a, uh, got myself a project already set up. I went ahead and did some pound includes and some using statements here to get everything set up. So let's start writing a class or some classes, right? So I'm going to have um, a class that I'll call shape, which is going to be my base class, right? And that class is going to serve as kind of like the foundation for my inheritance hierarchy that I'm going to do for you, right? So I'll go ahead and create a variable in here called name. This will keep the name of my different shapes. Okay, and I'll include a constructor for this. So shape and it's going to accept as an argument um, a string, which is going to be used to initialize the variable name, that class variable name. Okay, and then I'm going to have myself an accessor and a mutator, right? So we'll go ahead and set up a set method, set name. Okay. And all that's going to do is update variable name. Okay. And then we'll go ahead and have ourselves an accessor, a get method, right? And that's going to go ahead and return the string. Okay. And that's what we'll have for right now, right? To get us sort of started. Um, let's go ahead and create that shape. Right, and we'll instantiate an instance of class shape. So we'll call it shape S and we'll just name it blah. Okay. Or we'll just name it shape. How about that? Okay. And then um, what I'll do then is I'll print out, you know, I'll go ahead and retrieve the name here. And I made a mistake there. That should be get name. Sorry. So s.get name. Okay. And go ahead and run it just to test it make sure everything's working okay so so far so good All right so now let's go ahead and make a child class let's make a derived class let's create a class that i'll name circle okay so when i'm inheriting from another class i have to syntactically i have to include this colon here and then a class specifier which I'll uh, use public, right? And so what that thing does is that controls um, the access specifiers for any of the um, inherited members of the class, right? So, you know, class circle is going to inherit string name. It's going to inherit set name. It's going to inherit get name. And so if you make this class specifier public, then what happens is, is that the uh, access specifiers in the base class don't change when they're inherited into your um, child class, right? So in class circle, names still gonna be private and um, you know the set name and get name are gonna be public, 
okay um, and also um, since name is private the child class right this is the child class it's not going to be able to directly access name right we'll talk more about that here in a second but I have to specify which class that circle is a child of and it is a child of shape okay so now I can't just instantiate a circle just yet. I can't say circle um, C, for example, right? Uh, we got a problem there. And the problem is um, the base class's constructor has to be dealt with, right? There's no default constructor up here. It has to be passed some kind of an argument. So I'm going to need, in the very least, to provide a constructor for circle, okay? So I'm going to have to provide some other things too, but uh, let's do that right now. So circle, and um, we're going to have to pass a name up to shape, right? So we'll go ahead and have a parameter, okay? And what we're going to do is, is we're just going to pass that argument, that parameter, you know, when, when, when this thing gets instantiated, we're going to take what was passed to the constructor, and we're going to send it up to our base classes, uh, constructor. So how are we going to do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a colon here again. It's going to be similar, kind of similar syntax to what we saw before. And we're going to um, specify the name of the constructor in our in our uh, parent class, right? In our base class there. And so what I'm going to do is, is inside of parentheses here, I'm going to put what I want to send up there. And what I want to send up there is what was passed to the child class. Okay. So by doing that now, I should be able to run this, okay? So you see now that it runs, awesome. Now, here's where the, the benefits of inheritance come from. I get in my class circle, I inherit access to all of these methods, right? All the public stuff there. So I can then say C dot get name right so by doing that you know i don't have to rewrite this get name method here in class circle i inherited it right so you can see in my output you know that i'm i'm displaying the name okay so let's build on that now my class circle it's now capable of storing its name um, but i'm going to need to be able to store the radius of a circle, right? It's a circle, I want its radius, okay? So I'm gonna put a variable in for that, and I'm also going to add a second parameter, okay, for my constructor. And what that's gonna make me do, or what I'm gonna to need to do, is I'm gonna then need to uh, use that parameter to initialize a radius right here. Okay, so that's going to go in the body or in the in the uh, yeah the body for this for this uh, constructor method, right? So we'll go ahead and say radius equals um, underscore r, right? So now that I've done that, I've got a new class that, in addition to being able to store a name, right? Because we inherited that that ability from our parent class, um, I now have the ability to store a double. Okay, now I'm going to add an access or a mutator for updating and um, retrieving what's in radius. So void set radius, okay. And we'll go ahead and say radius equals r, and we'll sign our parameter to it. And then let's put our getter in there. Um, double get radius, okay. And we're just gonna return radius, okay. So, this is an example of the is a relationship. A circle is a shape. And so since a circle is a shape, it has everything that makes a shape a shape. Plus, since it's a circle, everything that makes it a circle, right? So it's a more specialized version of a shape, right? It's not just a shape, it's a circle shape, okay? So I've got to update my um, constructor arguments here, my arguments to the constructor. So I need to specify you know, some number that's gonna get stored in that radius variable. Okay, so 
we'll go ahead then and show that for you, right? We'll go ahead and say C dot get radius. Okay. So let's go ahead and run it, see what happens. Okay, so there you can see the updated output circle comma 2.1, right? Okay, so, you know, there's an example of inheritance. Well, let's add a couple more shapes here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add a, another shape that will also be derived from shape, right? And this is gonna be um, class rectangle, okay? Rectangle. And a rectangle is a shape also. Okay. And so my rectangle is going to need two variables, right? It's going to need one for length and it's going to need one for width. Okay. So I'm going to need a constructor for this for similar reasons that I need one for circle. So let's go ahead and throw that in there. Um, first one will be for the name and then the second will be for the length and then the third will be for the width. Okay. We'll pass the name up to the parent classes constructor. And then in the body of rectangles rectangle method, or it's a constructor method, we'll go ahead and initialize um, the length variable and the width variable. Okay. And we're gonna need to add accessors and mutators for both of those, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll say um, void set length, right, double L, and length is equal to underscore L. And then we'll do that for width also. So set width, and I'll use a different variable there. And then we'll say uh, width equals underscore w. Okay, so there's our setter methods for that. And then we'll get some accessors. Get length, right, which is just gonna return length. Okay, and then get width, which is just gonna return width. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so let's create a rectangle and we'll see if that thing works. Okay, so rectangle R to the rectangle and we'll pass it four and two to its constructors. And then let's go ahead and access get name, which we inherited from the shape class because we is a shape, a rectangle is a shape, right? And then we'll get its length and its width. Okay, so R dot get length and r dot get uh, width okay and let's put a comma in between those things too okay so let's test that see if our rectangle works okay so our rectangle class is also working awesome okay now let me show you something here uh, really quick um so in our base class, right, class shape, the name variable is private, right? And so that's going to impact how the child classes can interact with that variable, right? Since they're private, the child classes inherit them as private. So the child classes cannot directly access the parent class's private stuff, right? So you saw in um, the uh, circle class constructor, Okay, I invoked the parent class's constructor you know, to be able to change name, right? But if I made one slight little change, I'd be able to directly access it, right? So I can't do something like this. I can't say L equals underscore N, right? That's not gonna work because again, this is private up here, right? So you see the red squiggle here. But if I was to change the access specifier to protected, then that's not a problem. I can do that. See, now you can see in my derived class that um, name is now directly accessible. So in the base class, in shape, protected means private for all intents and purposes. It means private for everybody except my child, right? 
the child classes can directly access it when it's protected. Everybody else outside, all client code, all code outside the class can't directly access it, right? Um, and then you know what public means, okay? If it was public, then everybody could access this. Kids, everyone else, it doesn't matter, right? Um, public, very bad idea for stuff that shouldn't be public. Right? Protected, still kind of bad because, you know, I could um, try to assign some input or some, some data, I should say, to that name variable in my child class bypassing the constructor, right? Now that constructor might have some input validation code or something like that that controls what's acceptable to go into name here, right? So you wanna avoid using protected too, if you can, just to make sure that any validation code in a um, mutator method uh, doesn't get ignored, right? You should always try to access the parent class's private stuff um, or its, its variables through any methods that it provides, right? So through setters and getters. Okay, anyway, so let's continue on here. Um, all right, so let's talk about um, base classes, uh, abstract base classes and virtual functions, okay? So let's say that I want to include a get area method, right? So I want to do something like this, right? I want to have, I want to provide a method that's gonna, that's going to be able to be invoked uh, to tell us what the area of the shape is. Okay. Now here's the thing, right? You take a look in class shape. What do I have to work with here uh, in terms of area? Well, nothing, right? Because class shape is, is, is a shape. Well, what kind of shape? I can't know what formula to use to tell you the area of the shape if I don't know what kind of shape it is, right? So it doesn't make sense for you to create an entire get area method in the base class shape. I mean, what is the area of a shape? You need to know what the shape is, right? So because of that, um, you don't wanna to have to provide a definition. Now you know that a shape has an area, right? Anything that is going to be a shape is gonna have an area, but until you actually create the more specific the more specialized version of the shape, you're not gonna have enough information, right? Where's the radius? Where's the length and width? Okay, so the base class doesn't have the information. So what you wanna do instead is you wanna make what's called a pure virtual function, okay? You don't wanna have any definition. What you're doing is you're deferring the definition of that method to your children, right? Your children are gonna use it. So what you do is you put um, the virtual keyword here, and this is gonna look really weird, but you do it you assign zero, right, to the to the method header, basically. And that allows you to not have to have a body for your method. Okay, so this is what's known as a pure virtual function. Okay, and by adding that, you make class shape an abstract base class. So what does that mean? Okay, well, what it means is, is that class shape can no longer be instantiated. See that little red squiggly under there? Matter of fact, I'll even comment these out just so there's no confusion here about what's about to happen. Okay, so this can't be compiled anymore, right? Why? Because if you've got a pure virtual method, right? Pure virtual function, um, that means that this class no longer is supposed to ever become an object, right? You're never supposed to be able to instantiate this. This class now only exists to be inherited from. It's like a starting template. Anything that is a shape is gonna have this constructor. Anything that is a shape is gonna have a name. It's gonna have a set name, get name method. And it also must have a get area method. Okay, definition. Now, if you take a look, if I comment out shape, okay, and we get back to, you know, just trying to instantiate a circle, create a circle object, right? Well, guess what? This thing's gonna crap out also. Why? Because a circle is a shape, right? So it inherited this pure virtual function, okay? So that forces you to provide a get area method in any class that is a shape, right? So that means that I'm gonna have to go down here and define 
a specialized get area method that works just for circle, right? So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll say get area, okay, um, const, and then I'll put my definition here. So what's the area for a circle? Well, radius times radius times, I'll give an estimation for pi, 14159, good enough for us. Okay, so now once I do that, you can see the squiggle's gone, okay, and I can now compile and run. So let's invoke that get area method too. Okay. Uh, C dot get area. Okay, so now what I have is, is I have a get area method for my circle that is defined just for the circle itself. Okay, now similarly for class rectangle, I'm gonna need to do that too. See the red squiggles back? So when I try to compile, that. So that forces me then, well, hey, a rectangle is a shape also, so I better provide a get area method for my rectangle, right? So that's going to be, you know, length times width, okay? So now that I've provided that, I'll go ahead and run it, and you can see now if we compile, and I'll go ahead and add a line for the get area also in here, right? I'll, I'll update my, my CL statement. It's so r.get area. Okay, so that forces any inherited class, right? Any inherited class to implement their own get area method. You have to do it, you have to do it, right? If you inherit from an abstract base class, you must, you have no choice. You must override, right, your inherited pure virtual function. Okay, it forces that on you. All right, so let me show you another thing here. Now, you don't have to just, I mean, you can have indirect inheritance, right? You don't have to, you're not just limited to, you know, one level, right? So circle inherits from shape, right? So parent, child, you can have grandchildren too. So let's take this one step further. Let's add another class and I'll call this class solid, okay? And class solid is a, rectangle, right? It is a rectangle. So I'm going to be inheriting from class rectangle. So what this means is that solid is a rectangle. But remember, a rectangle is a shape. So if a solid is a rectangle and a rectangle is a shape, that means that a solid is a shape also. So what's going to happen is, is that class solid is going to inherit everything that a shape is and everything that a rectangle is. Okay. So let's go ahead and um, get this guy going, right? So what's the solid going to be? It's going to be a three-dimensional rectangle, essentially, right? So what do I have to add? I have to add some depth to my rectangle, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and create a constructor for this. So we'll call it, uh, well, it's got to be the name of the class, right? And so I'm going to need what um, for my constructor? I'm going to need a parameter for the name, for the length and width, which I'll pass to the rectangle constructor, uh, those three guys. And then I'll also need another parameter for the depth. Okay, so let's go ahead and throw that in there. So name, length, oops, not, it's not string, double. Uh, width, and then uh, depth. Okay, so let's invoke the parent classes constructor. We'll pass up to it the name, and then the length, and then the width, okay? And then in the body of this constructor, we'll just uh, set the depth, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and test this thing, All right? So we'll create a solid, solid S, we'll give it a name, and we'll throw some numbers in there, uh, three, two, four. Okay, fine. Um, and then let's go ahead and invoke its get name method and let's invoke its get area method. Okay, and you might be looking at that going, what are you talking about? It doesn't have a get area method. I don't see where you wrote get area or get name or anything. Like that. That's right. So we inherited the get area method of our parent, right? The direct parent is class rectangle, but remember rectangle is also a shape, so we also indirectly inherited 
the get name method, right? So that's that's one of the awesome things about inheritance is the fact that you can do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and run it. So you can see there's the name, solid, and then the area. Now, look at that area and it was six, right? Well, what should the area of the solid be? It should be three times two times four, not three times two, right? Three times two is six, but we need to multiply that six times four. Why didn't we do that? Because the get area method that we inherited from our parent class which is multiplying length times width. So let's provide our own get area method for solid, right? So double get area const, and you're thinking, oh cool, well what we'll do is we'll just return the length times the width times the depth, right? I mean, we inherited length and width, right? So that should work. Uh, no, right, why? Because remember our parent class length and width are private, right? So nobody gets to access, no ch child code, no client code, no code outside the class whatsoever can access length and width when they are private, right? So an easy fix for this, although bad idea, unless you have a really good reason protected, still generally a bad idea, right? But once I do that, once I make these two guys protected, now the child can directly access length and width. Stuff outside the class rectangle can't use the dot operator length and width, as always. Um, everyone else, those guys are considered private. It's just the children who can now directly access them, right? So you take a look at that, and now the solid uh, has the right area, okay? So bad idea. Don't do this. So you might be thinking, well, how am I going to get the length and width then? Well, I inherited a get length and get uh, width method, right? I inherited those from class rectangle, so I will use those, okay? So now, check it out, works just fine, right? That is the better way to do it in almost all cases, because again, you're using, you're forced to use the public interface that's provided um, by your parent class, and that forces you to run all the code in the, in the attached methods. All right, so next up, what I wanna show you is um, some polymorphism, right? I want to show you um, another example of that, okay? Now this is cool. I'm gonna go ahead and comment on all this stuff here um, because we don't need it for this example. Here's what I'm gonna do, okay? I'm gonna create a vector of shape pointers, okay? And it has to be pointers, okay? The way that this is implemented in um, C++, you got to use pointers for this. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Okay, this is a vector of pointers, of, of shape pointers. And I'm going to use an initialization list. Okay, now what's going to happen is, is that I'm going to create instances of class circle, class rectangle, and class solid. Okay, so I'm going to say new uh, circle, right, and we'll call that thing circle. And we'll give it a radius of, I don't know, 2.1. Okay, so this right here dynamically allocated a new circle invoking its constructor, passing it the name circle and 2.1, right? So that's going to be the first item that gets, the memory address of that circle is going to be the first thing that gets added to my vector, okay? So this new, remember, is returning memory address for the circle object, and that's getting stored in the vector. Okay, we'll do a similar thing for a rectangle, okay? And we gotta give it some dimensions, so there you go, okay? And finally, we'll do a similar thing for a solid, okay? Now we'll call a solid a solid, and we'll call um, its dimensions, I don't know, one, two, three, okay? So what did I just do? This is going to instantiate three different types of objects, right? Three different types of objects. A circle, rectangle, solid. The memory addresses of each one of those is now going to be assigned to my vector, right? And so what this kind of allows me to do is assign three different data types to the same vector. Right? Normally you couldn't do that. You'd have to make a vector of integers or a vector of circles or a vector of circle pointers, right? But because of the fact that 
A circle is a shape. A rectangle is a shape. A solid is a shape. I can do this, right? That's polymorphism. The memory address of each of these objects is being treated as if they are all the same because they are, right? They're each one of those, the memory address of each one of these objects is a shape's memory address because a circle is a shape, a rectangle is a shape, and a solid is a shape, okay? Now, what this will allow me to do, right, is to take a loop, a for loop, and I'll iterate over the uh, vector and for each shape whose address is in that vector, I'll invoke the getName method and the getArea method, right? So getName, right? And getArea, okay? So here's the thing about this. Let's go ahead and test it. I got a memory leak. I'll fix that here in a second, okay? So there's circle, rectangle, solid, okay? Now, <clears throat> what happened here was that the memory address for the circle object was assigned to S. And so I dereferenced that, invoked the getName method, okay? And the getName method is the same for all of the objects, right? And so then you saw the names. Now the getArea method, okay, even though there is no getArea method definition for a shape, right? Um, you know, what get area methods are being invoked, right? Shape itself doesn't have a get area method. So on its face, this kind of looks ridiculous. You're like, well, how does that even, how does that even work? I mean, it, the, the shape doesn't have, this is where polymorphism and the fact that they're virtual methods comes into play, right? Because this is a virtual get area method. So at runtime, What's happening is, is that the compiler is going, oh, well, um, get area method. Well, this is the memory address that's assigned here. Well, where did that come from? Oh, well, that came from a circle. Even though it is a shape, it came from a circle object. And so let me go ahead and execute the get area method for um, the circle object, right? And then uh, for the next item in the vector, it's so, all, okay, well, uh, where did this memory address come from? Oh, well, it came from a rectangle. Okay, so then I'll go ahead and invoke the get area method for the rectangle. And then for the third one, it says, oh, well, where'd the memory address for this come from? Well, oh, that's, that came from a solid. So then I'm gonna invoke the get area method um, for the solid object, right? So what that's an example of is polymorphism and something that's called dynamic binding, right? So you're treating all of the objects as if they are the same. So that allows you to assign all their memory addresses to the same vector, even though they're different objects, but they are the same object because they all is a shape, but also the dynamic binding at runtime, C++ was able to determine, oh, okay, which get area method, which version of that am I actually gonna execute right now, okay? So really, 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 really cool. Um, so, Last thing I got to do, I got to fix my memory leak, so we'll do that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, use another loop here. We got to go through and we got to iterate over that vector uh, shape by shape, uh, deleting uh, each of its um, objects, right? Got to go through each one of the uh, memory addresses in that vector and then delete their the objects. So we'll go ahead and do that right now. Um, so just have something that looks similar here. And we'll just delete um, S. Okay, so that should do it. So that, that'll clean up my memory leak. Let's just double check. All right, cool. Okay, so here's a UML diagram showing our classes and their relationships to each other. When dealing with inheritance, you use an open-headed arrow. And when you want to specify something is being abstract, right? Then you uh, italicize it, right? So you see that the name of shape is italics, uh, get area uh, also uh, italicized. And you can see that we've got, you know, you just follow the arrows 
uh, in the direction that they're pointing. So you can see that start with solid. Well, solid is a what? Well, what's it pointing at? Rectangle. Right now, what are rectangle and circle? Well, rectangle and circle, they're both pointing at shape, right? So a solid is a rectangle, and then a rectangle is a shape. Therefore, solid is a shape, and then similarly, circle uh, is a shape. So the query tags here are specifying that you know the uh, methods are cons, they're accessors, and um, that's that's pretty much it, right? So there's your UML diagram. Um, the unique features here really being the arrows and uh, the italicized font for the abstraction. Okay, so that's going to bring this video to a close. If you felt that the video was useful, please consider giving the video a thumbs up. And if you thought that the video sucked, well, then you've got that thumbs down button as an option as well. If you'd like to see more videos, if you're interested in more content from the channel, feel free to hit that subscribe button. And as usual, if you're a student of mine and you have further questions, feel free to drop me an email or to stop by my office hours. Okay, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.